We're looking at the Eucharist and, and the Lord's Supper, covenant meal. And it's really important to ask first, well, why is this so important? Um, as you may have read in uh, Common Ground, at uh, one point, you know, one of the noted uh, fundamentalist or evangelical theologians in his eight-volume set on systematic theology has a third of a page dedicated to the Eucharist. <laughs> and uh, the reason is he's not really thinking it's that important. And so what we're saying is, is that it is vital. We're saying that it teaches you the meaning of love. Now, if I say that right then, a lot of people are saying, I, I, I'm trying to hear that, I'm trying to see that, but all my experience around the Lord's Supper or Eucharist, saying that it's going to teach me what the meaning of love is about, it seems very distant. And the reality is that all of us have been significantly shaped by our culture more than we have by the scriptures, certainly more than we have than uh, how people in the New Testament time understood concepts and ideas around the, the covenant meal. The reality is, is that everyone has a very complicated way of understanding things. It's just wrong most of the time. You and I think what we have learned uh, is simple because we've learned it. Do you know what I'm saying? You just know someone who comes from another culture, from another country to come here, all our little sayings and all the way our idioms and how we view the culture, all this stuff is very complex. We've learned for years and years. But if someone comes from the outside, they're going to be very confused. Uh, I'm told that the, the, the English language has the, the deepest, <laughs> deepest uh, vocabulary of any language. And so, so, but for us, we think, hey, it's easy to speak, speak English. I do it all the time. My kids do. Without understanding that there's, a, there's a levels of complexity that we've just bought into. So you should know right away. When we say, must it be so complicated? We're complicated. We've just taken for granted our complication and think that since we're familiar with it, it's easy. Once you learn anything, it's easy. The question is, was it worth learning and is it accurate? And when it comes to the understanding of the Eucharist and the Lord's Supper or the covenant meal, however you wish to view it, there are ways of understanding that, they, that the early church understood that are quite simple but very different than the way we intuit it because of our layers of complexity which are primarily individualistic and are not deeply biblical and are overall completely ignorant of how the early church practiced these things. The way we understand things, we piece things together that shouldn't even fit. We have ideas that don't even make any sense, like you can be a Christian outside of Christian community. Now, I know that just sounds like a bombshell to many people. I know for some of you, many of you, it doesn't sound that way, but still it probably feels a little foreign because it just seems, well, that seems so judgmental, right? That's the other way that we'll come into it. We'll think, well, that seems so judgmental. The reason we say that is because we have, by our culture, an understanding that if we think something different than someone else, and we come out with a different conclusion so that we will contrast our conclusion with their present set of ideas and think them wrong, we're arrogant. Well, if we have any temptation for arrogance, hopefully when you hear what I'm going to tell you about, you'll see that you are wrong in so many ways. Um, and myself too, my, my intuition, I want to confess to you, even though I've studied all this, my intuition is more American and individualistic than it is Semitic, Mediterranean, Eastern, uh, Hebraic, and, and that really gets me into trouble. Because if I want the Bible to speak for what it is supposed to be understood to mean, I have to discard one set of presuppositions, one, one intuition 
so that I can enter in another way of understanding and take on a new intuition, which we can. So the first thing I have to say, we, we, um, we, have to, we have to put aside some things and we have to say, brothers and sisters, it's, it is work. It is work to think. In our culture today, uh, more and more people don't give themselves to the discipline of thinking. And they don't because primarily uh, they operate out of their feelings and their sentiments and their intuition. And in our culture, feelings and sentiment and intuition are more powerful than truth. And you won't do the work and I won't do the work unless I love God. I'm going to say that's how hard it is. You won't do it unless you love God and you really want to know the truth because he is the way, the truth, and the life, and you want to live the life in truth. See, most Christians are not called on to an exercise of their con concentration or to their ability to study or to pray what they study or to discuss what they study. They're not called on to that because there just is no room in our culture for that kind of dialogue. The, idea, the whole idea of the covenant me meal comes from this, this biblical idea of covenant. It's a meal where you celebrate the covenant, where, you, where the covenant is energized, and where the covenant is made all the more real. Co this covenant is a way of life. Eucharist calls you to a way of life. It is not receiving elements, and then receiving the elements, you get power through the elements. If receiving of the elements of the bread and wine are not understood correctly, you may think you get power, and I know sometimes, you know, uh, in anecdotal situations, uh, that people have experienced healing. They've done that even like in their own kitchens. You know, they, hey, let's bring out the wine or grape juice and let's bring out matzah or, or some bread and let's have this service going on. And you know what? I think, you know, they're looking to God and God meets them. But that's still not biblical. Uh, that's not, I mean, in other words, God blessed God for moving that way. But do you understand that everything that God does um, doesn't develop you can't develop a whole theology out of. Now we'll talk about this, but I just want to give you some images. What's at stake? Why can't we just let people come on in? Come on in and receive the Eucharist. Come on in a covenant meal and be blessed. Get everybody a blessing. You know, they come in the covenant meal. Why not? Well, when people don't understand what the meal means, they'll have to impose their own understanding. When they haven't done any study, about the meal, and they haven't done any kind of exegesis of the passage, and they haven't understood how it was understood in the early church in the documents that we have about how that was lived out. And they just say, I don't need any of that stuff. They are denying a move of the Holy Spirit for centuries. You know, the Holy Spirit uh, didn't just come at Pentecost and then Azusa Street. The Holy Spirit has been alive in the church, and there's been moments more alive than others, but the Holy Spirit did not go away uh, when he landed in Jerusalem, so to speak, uh, 2,000 some years ago. He was still present. And so the Holy Spirit is continuing to teach the church and continue to guide the church. And if it's from the Holy Spirit, I want to know. Because that's the spirit that lives within me. And ultimately, you know what I want to know? Because what the scripture teaches me, I want to know how to love. I want to know how to love like God loves. I want to know what it means to love like God loves, not how I might think it means to love. I want to understand how he understands it means to love because, because, it's, because in the scriptures it's called the Lord's Supper, not the Christian's Supper. You getting the distinction there? It's not Christians who say, hey, let's just have, let's just have this meal together. Let's say these certain words. And let's make it kind of special. And, you know, I feel like this is a good service. Let, let's do this. 
And uh, it's like Jesus isn't really the host of the supper. We're not really in his house, and he doesn't own it. It's his supper. So, for instance, if you came to my house, I said, come on over for dinner, and you came to my house, and, you know, you, you, uh, you brought, like, uh, spare ribs or something, and, uh, and, you, and you told me, you sit over here, and you sit over there, <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we're going to have to leave. It's, you're going to have to leave, because well, we need some time to clean up while we're gone. And so you can come back, but we'll clean up afterwards. And you just kind of take over. I'm thinking, what's going on here? I thought I was having you over for supper, but now you're acting like you're having me over for supper in my house. <laughs> and that's what happens in the church all the time. Christians get a view of what they think the Lord's Supper is supposed to be about based on what they would like. Uh, when, when Jesus had the supper with his disciples, he had a whole idea how this, uh, whether it's the Passover meal in particular or anticipated it, there's something about the Passover of that meal, and he had a whole different way of having that meal and having table fellowship in a way that was never done before. Like saying, this is my body, and then giving the bread, and this is my blood, and then giving the wine. That was never done before. <laughs> you know, no one could say, hey, Jesus, you're not doing it right. This is how we've always done it. But no, it's his meal. So that's an important thing that everything in the church gets self-reflective a lot of times in our culture. What would we like? So we think in, our, in the contemporary culture, if we just kind of all feel good about one another, and it might be if, if we know the people there, we've forgiven the people there that we know, and let's just now have the wine and have the bread. It says we're brothers and sisters. Let's say it says we're brothers and sisters. Okay, now what does it mean to be a brother and sister? And is that all that it's supposed to say? The word for fellowship, kinonia, means something more than just, uh, just sharing our lives together. The Lord, in the Lord's Supper, in the covenant meal, it means sharing the Lord's life. Not just sharing our lives. He sets the pitch. And it's sharing in his life and in his way of life and what he how he thinks we're supposed to live. The word fellowship, when you look at it in the Greek, and for those of you who got the, the book, Table Fellowship and the Eucharist in the First Four Centuries of the Church by Werner Illert, that the word fellowship is not primarily... Um, us simply uh, having relationships with each other. It is participating in something that changes how we have a relationship. We cannot have a relationship, we can't have a certain way of understanding our relationship with one another, then say, this is Christian fellowship. We can't say that because we're Christians and we're socializing, we're having Christian fellowship. We're not. It's Christians who are socializing. In the New Testament understanding and in the early church for centuries, centuries, the idea of fellowship was participating in something that you entered into a whole way of life. Let me, we'll talk about this more, but I'm just trying to, here's my point here. And I'm going to fill that out. I'm going to complete that thought, but not too much. We'll talk more about it later. But, what I want to say is, why can't we just have people from the street walk in and receive the Eucharist? I'm trying to give you understandings of the depth behind all this that's so different the way that most people understand it. So then at that juncture, you see, we have a choice. Either we must change how we view the Eucharist so that it's just conditioned based on how people want it to be and understand it to be, which is very individualistic, uh, so that we'd have to become individualistic, so then we would not be community anymore, so that we wouldn't understand our commitment to each other the same way that we do now. Or we have to say, for those who would want to come, can you just put that on hold for a while? Let me 
reintroduce to you another way of thinking about this meal, the way that, let me explain more clearly the scriptures, let me explain more clearly the background, and let me understand, and let me help you understand that it's not participating in a rite, but it's participating in something, a way of life that that Eucharist symbolizes that you're making a commitment of your whole life to. In the second scenario, that changes an entire person's life. In the first scenario, the person's life is pretty much untouched. I said a lot there, so I'm going to pause. Well, let me finish that one thought about fellowship, just as a concept. So we'll talk more about this. This is more of an introduction and summary of some other things I'll explore later in more detail. The Greek word for fellowship is a better understanding. Here is God's fellowship. So we'll, we'll put it this way. God's fellowship and this is, this is a way of life which includes a way of thinking acting believing which, by the way, I mean by that trusting. I don't simply mean, I don't simply mean uh, adhering to particular theological presuppositions. Primarily, this fellowship, brothers and sisters, is trust. Trust in God, and in God, trust with one another. The word for trust and the word for belief come from the same Greek word. See, community can't happen without trust. I could speak the truth to you. You could agree with everything I say. But if you don't mix trust with it, there's no community. And this is how God is. See, God, God has this environment of trust. Which, of course, is predominantly all this is just filling out what it means to love. So when we're saying fellowship. Let's have fellowship. What we're meaning to say is we, as individuals, come into fellowship in the way God has fellowship. Ah, now we have fellowship together in a way of life, thinking, acting, believing, in a way of love. Does that make sense to you? So the fellowship in the New Testament, in the early centuries, the church understood you are participating in a way of life it was defined by Jesus Christ. And you know, they had something in mind. The early pastors and the people that made up those communities had a way of life. We don't. Oh, but does that matter? Do you understand? Of course these things matter. I mean, it's a rhetorical question, but it, there's so much lost. See, I asked you at the beginning how much you wanted to know the truth. See, this will mess you up. This is, a, and I said it's a spiritual question because there's going to be times when you would prefer another definition of fellowship. Mm -hmm. When you would prefer a fellowship that we're, we just all got together and we just prayed. Mm -hmm. We say, hey, that's fellowship. Hey, the spirit was moving. Are you saying that's not the spirit? You know, I'm not saying it's not the spirit. I'm just saying it's not the fellowship of the New Testament. Don't make me make judgments on other people. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to, the question is, what did the Lord intend? And I bet you most people have no idea what I just said when they're talking about fellowship. But in things that I've read, I haven't read a contradiction to it. So when someone's coming to participate in the Eucharistic meal, which he says, if you want the meal, you have it here. You can't have it here because there's no way of life here. We don't know how you're thinking. We don't know how you're trusting. We don't know how you're loving. And it's always a part of a way of life. That's why walk-ins are not welcome. They may be at Sam's, but not in the church, not supposed to be. Walk in to evangelize, to instruct, this is where we're going. Do you understand this? Mm -hmm. yes. I do believe that most of the time, but 
I think most of the time in the New Testament, uh, the, the points of issue are moral. I don't believe that they're primarily doctrinal. Um, and when it talks about the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, it does mention that um, one of those is doctrinal, but not, that's not generally what the case is. It says, but I say walk by, this is Galatians 5, verses 16, but I say walk by the uh, Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. This is where the rending happens. For uh, these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes may be the only doctrinal one there. Disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I just looked at one, one piece. Sure. There are, you know, in John, you probably have the Gnostic, you know, problem. But um, in general, and, and in Corinth, there's some problems, but it's still not fully fleshed out because he still addresses them as brethren. So the... Uh, in general, in the first centuries, it was Gentiles learning a whole new way of life. And they had, this, they had the, which is a part of the faith. Mm -hmm. See, only for us, we think the faith is doctrine. And it is doctrine. How to live your life is doctrine. That's very doctrinal. So um, that's why I say individualism is heretical, because it is doctrinally against trust and against love and it separates and so uh, we that's what I was going to say at the very beginning which I didn't but now I will that we have this sense of theology and we think theology is is just these these teachings you know like the Trinity and you know the two natures of Christ and etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know that's true and that's important and it, but that makes also a difference in how you live your life but uh, for the for the first generation that it was primarily moral and a way of life. And it was even a problem, problematic because those things always had to go on even among the, the different heretical factions. And now all of them practice the same kind of morality as others. So in the New Testament, the faith is uh, almost primarily, from looking at it, is almost primarily the issue of trust. Only in certain places, does it, does it, can it imply that it's doctrinal? Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying uh, that, what we call doctrinal, yeah. propositional. Probably. I should say that because sure. yeah. doctrinal is a way of life. <laughs> so I'll say propositional, uh, rational, concept, conceptual thinking about certain truths okay. about <laughs> God. Yes, there you go. Divorced of how I live my life. But see, they didn't do that. But anyway, we do that. So, um, so I think what I'm trying to say is I think we're interjecting a division that didn't exist. They're, they're one in a piece uh, of a whole piece. So um, the, do the way of life and what you believed had something to do with it. See, this is a powerful point like right here. What you believe about the Eucharist, what you believe about covenant, what you believe about fellowship, these are biblical words we're using now. If you have a biblical understanding, and you can see it kind of explained throughout history, if you have that kind of understanding, then you're understanding, well, I can't just live as an alone individual. That's a doctrinal statement. Mm -hmm. So some will say, wait a second, I have the Holy Spirit. I can do that. And they say, well, okay, well, maybe you have the Holy Spirit, but what is fellowship? So, for instance, we look at this passage here in um, 1 John. The first chapter of 1 John. It's really, it's really clear again when he talks about fellowship and how he's referring to it all. Oops. It says, What was in the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld, and our hands handled concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested, it says, to us. 
not just to me, to us, in what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you also, verse 3, that you also may have fellowship with us. Well, we don't want fellowship with you. We just want fellowship with God. <laughs> well, that's what he says. We may also have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. He's just talking as a community, entering into a community, which primarily is a community that seeks to reflect the community of the Father and the Son. It's really very important. You see, we understand, and see, here's something too. You see, when we see this image, brothers and sisters, we all fall short. What I want to do is, what I want to do is, I want to pluck out an individualistic way of viewing things, a way that we've just kind of adopted without even thinking, so that we can instead have a biblical way of understanding things, so that we can love God and love one another in a, in a, in a greater depth. But, you know, so this, so I'm teaching, the teaching, the fact that you know the teaching isn't an automatic open door into the fellowship, is it? Right. But at least we're clear, because we have to deal, now we're dealing with the heresy in America <laughs> that's more predominant. Other cultures don't even have this problem that uh, still have a flavor of a sense of identity in community. But in America, we don't operate, we don't operate that way. We think man is the center of all things, and we, and we choose, we can choose what we want. And God will bless us because he loves us. So we, but we're not thinking, what does it mean to love as God loves? So what's at stake? What's at stake, again, is love. It's the nature of um, how the Lord wants us to live. Fellowship. Uh, it's the nature of... Uh, how the Lord can form us in our thinking, in our life, in our lifestyle. And it's, uh, so it's a choice for a particular kind of life. I mean, God's life, which we're affirming in our covenant meal. So if people are taking, so, and then if you don't, you scatter. If you don't see this vision, you just think, well, why not just be on my own? What difference does it make if I have it in my own kitchen or if I have it with you guys? Hey, isn't it covenant, covenant? We're all in covenant, right? See, so covenant becomes kind of tangential or it becomes so abstract. It's like, you know, I have a covenant with God. It's not a covenant for a way of life that reflects his fellowship. I'm not saying that people don't have covenant of some sort, but the question is, in the biblical sense, in the early sense, fellowship and covenant meant a way of life that they entered into, and people don't see that anymore. Come on, think of some people you're thinking of. How are you going to talk about this to them without sounding like you're not a part of a cult? <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah. But is it biblical or not? You know, that's the thing. You, you just hammer at it if you don't think it is. You just throw everything you got at me because I'm saying that it is. But you, but, and, and, and I'm saying this is where I want to go there because I want to be truer to that vision. But if not, that's why I say, you know, this is a mess up your destiny. <laughs> what you thought your destiny was. This will put you in places you don't want to necessarily want to go. See, the nature of truth is reflective of Jesus Christ. Wherever there's truth, here's a good thing to know, brothers and sisters, which we, don't, we forget in a Western culture. Truth will always lead you into love. There's no such thing as truth, and, and then there's love. Truth and love, speaking the truth in love that the, the church has built up. In the biblical sense, they're synonymous. So that in James it says, you're acting a particular way where you lie against the truth. It says their lifestyle was not reflecting what their profession was, so they lied against the truth. Well, how they lived didn't look like they were true. Do you understand, brothers and sisters, the church is supposed to make us truer people. We're supposed to have more integrity about what it means to love, more authentic, more real. The superficiality is supposed to be stripped away. See, this is dangerous, because when you move into the truth, you get exposed in the level of vulnerability. Because here's the truth. Now the question is, what will you do with it? Because it's always a life decision. It's a life decision. So I've been in situations, because I know certain things, where I've been with people who don't know certain things. And uh, there's a measure of suffering because of that. 
I'm misunderstood. I remember at a pastor's meeting, they, they typically, they still do to my knowledge, they go away once a year and they just uh, all get together and at the end they have a time where they share the Lord's Supper together. And, and you know, I just shared, well, I, I wouldn't be participating in it and I don't mean to be offensive. Why? Why can't I participate in it? It's because I love them, that's why. Because I believe that people should stop and think about what it means. I understand they don't believe what I believe about it, but the question is, can I just say, that's okay, it doesn't matter? I'm certainly not going to say they should do what I do. I'm not going to do that either. But I'm also going to say it doesn't matter. How can, they, how can they repent? How can they help me in my own repentance if I can't identify with what I know to be true? So this one brother, this is a great case in point, this one brother um, who is a pastor, he would, he'd share, he shared about it. And as he shared about it, he said that was the most meaningful time I've ever had with, with the brothers and with the Lord. And his, he was, tears were just coming down his eyes. And then tears were you know, filling up other people's eyes. He says, that was just so significant to me. In a year, he left his church, and he refused to talk to any other pastors about why. Totally incongruent. A full contradiction of what covenant means. No relationship of any significance except for sharing a sentimental moment with other brethren. And probably it was just a, it was probably a cry out for some connectedness and thought that perhaps they, in the aura of the moment, that there might have been something that he received. I'm not judging the man. I'm judging the doctrine. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not judging the man. It's that teaching. See, I'm saying that teaching is not benign. It supports fragmentation. It prevents us from having to think about how I will have to go to the cross by loving my brothers and sisters by living in the light with my brothers and sisters, by committing myself to a way of life with them. And I don't believe that's what God wants. Obviously. So I hope what I've done is I hope um, you will love the Lord and you will love your brothers and sisters and really do the work you need to do in reading through and thinking through this stuff. I'm making it an issue of worship because it is. Worship is always right living before God. It's a way of life. Now I know some people aren't as conceptual as others and to be honest, our educational system is so sloppy that our minds probably are pretty flabby. But you know that but God can help us. And we can get enough of a sense of things where we can still identify with it and speak the truth to one another. We have to be a little more bolder in this. See, I, I, the Holy Spirit has to birth His Word in us about this. It can't happen if you and I don't study it, meditate on it, pray about it, write questions that we have as we're going through it. If we don't do that work, it does make a difference on the kind of fellowship we experience. You seeing that? Mm -hmm. So this isn't like so that we're really smart people. This is so that we can really be people of fellowship. So that we know how to speak the truth to one another. Um, numbers of people, numbers of people uh, in the past have heard this stuff and they think, well, that theoretically that's true, but you know, I can't really live that out. This, brothers and sisters, is, uh, is a step to the wall. See, this, these truths, brothers and sisters, are going to peg you and me. You come to the place where if it's true, you can't say, I can take it or leave it. If it's a part of a divine revelation, you have to say, I have to give my life to this. For me, when I, uh, like when I was checking out the other communities out east, 
Um, there's just certain things I knew about the Eucharist even then that closed doors in my experience of those communities. They just wouldn't be open. If I, was, if I did not know certain things about fellowship and the Eucharist, those doors would have been open to me. And you know what? On a practical level, some things would have been easier. See, it messes up with your life, is what I'm saying. But my goal isn't, my goal isn't, well, kind of, how can I be, how can I get the best of, of whatever? My goal is, what does God say? And then I give myself to the Holy Spirit with other brothers and sisters so he can do the work that he needs to do and give me grace because I will come to the end of myself and he will give me grace to love at a higher level and to continue on. That's why this is not abstract and that's why it's spiritual. Because if, the Eucharist, if, we if we have the Eucharist and we're participating in it and people aren't being transformed to love at a higher level, it contradicts its own image. Everyone who comes to the Eucharist should understand that they're making a commitment to a way of life, a way of thinking, a way of acting, a way of believing and trusting, a way of loving, where that becomes the cent where their lives now are, are centered around God's understanding of fellowship. See, in most understandings, people look at church as, yeah, I'd like a good church. And what they mean is, you know, a supplement of support to my Christian life. They're not saying... I want a church that will totally shape my lifestyle. <laughs> but the, na the nature of fellowship and the nature of church is supposed to do that. The reason this is obscured, by the way, you have a question, you just raise your hand and interrupt me. But the reason that this is obscured is because we have settled and we've recognized and we are okay with hundreds of, of churches in Fort Collins. How many churches are there in Fort Collins, uh, Mark? About 130. About 130. So some people would say, isn't that beautiful? I mean, some would not, but some would say, <laughs> some would say, no, you know, different kind of colors in the rainbow and, you know, different flowers in the garden and different giftings and whatever emphasis. But what it's saying is it makes a justification for disunity. In the early church, and right in the New Testament, you see, Paul addresses... One church, one city. It would be inconceivable to have two churches in a city. Why? Uh, so that, because Christ is whole. So let's say this is Corinth. It's not, I mean, of course it's not in many respects, but this is just a figure here. <laughs> okay? So, uh, so let's say, so then we say, okay, they're celebrating the Eucharist right here. And then people over here are saying, Hey, man, what are you, that's too far. We need to, here's our boundary line. We'll have the Eucharist right here. They could never even think of such a thing. We're the only ones that think it's too long of a commute. <laughs> <laughs> that's the reason to divide the body of Christ because of the level of the commute. They'd never thought that way. So you can only have one Eucharist because there's only one Christ. There's only one body of Christ, and I know we say, oh, that's true, that's true, but, you know, really, we're not living that out. Mm -hmm. We say it's true, but how we demonstrate, it looks like we don't believe it. Because, no, really, how do you, when do you, where is this dividing line? When did the Holy Spirit say, well, let's see, it's a 50-mile radius. <laughs> then you're talking, it's totally personal preference. They never saw it. So Paul addresses Paul addresses one church for one city because he understood, just like during the times, just like there was even one temple of a god, you know, the god of the city. So they're saying, you have, there's one temple here for Christ, which is, of course, the body of Christ, the tabernacle of God, and you all gather there. There is no justifiable reason for several configurations that call themselves churches in the biblical witness. And we have tolerated that, and we accept that, but there should be great repentance for that. And where we kind of accommodate it and we accept it, that prevents us from understanding that the church is inherently community. We think we can devise it the way we want. And then someone will say, but if we do this, if you realize how much conversation it would be and how much work, you know, can we afford that? How about building a kingdom? 
So you don't build the kingdom our way. We build the kingdom God's way. Mm -hmm. And if there isn't the love, and if there isn't a manifestation of the fellowship of God, are we building the kingdom, even though we have more people seated, seated in a folding chair in one particular place, in another particular place, in another particular place, and these people don't even know each other? <laughs> we should say unacceptable. See, you're called to be a prophet. When you hear the word of God, you're called to be a prophet, aren't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. This is prophetic. And uh, this is, uh, I'm going to end with this. I think there's a, a powerful analogy with this. You understood what I just said, right? Yeah. What, the primary thing I'm trying to do today, tonight is, is communicate the uniqueness of this vision and how it matters. That's significant. Now, why, why well, should I go away with just that? What am I left with then? That's just an idea. Well, it's like this. It's like if I say I'm married to Gerilyn, but... I have a girl upstairs and I have a girl downstairs, you know, and uh, they're attractive to me. And my wife has come to just accept it. And I kind of like it too. Then I'm saying I have a warped understanding of love, fidelity, and loyalty. So what I'm trying to do is I'm calling us all to repent of all the women or the men that we have on the side because we think we have options and we think that's what love looks like. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do is give us a vision to say, you have no options. You have no alternatives. Love is loyalty, is commitment. It's a way of life and it's to specific people living a specific way of life. I have, so that's all I'm trying to do and it's significant because then, then it's like, well then, What's God's will? Well, you got a lot of answers right there. You know, how should I live? A lot of answers right there. There's practical. You know, it's like, well, how can I, since you're saying fellowship is something kind of that I press into, where am I, where are the obstacles to fellowship in my life right now? Where's my individuality? Where, in a sense of the negative sense of that meaning of that term, where am I asserting myself and think I have my options? That prevents love. That is of the flesh. So I'm trying to speak to ourselves first so that we understand where we're going to go. And, uh, and then we can speak to each other to call each other on toward that image. Because I think it's still too nebulous. So in other words, what I'm trying to do in a way is develop a, 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 a godly angst so we don't accept the status quo and think, well, since it's just kind of everywhere, it's got to be okay, because God wouldn't allow it to be everywhere, would he? And since, and what I'm trying to do with this, because I think a part of us is divided, don't you think? Don't you think yeah, a part yeah, of us yeah. is divided? So a part of us thinks, well, if we have, there's so many people, and they're getting blessed in these other ways, and things seem to be going so good, and so to quote, by, by a certain, another standard, not necessarily love or fellowship, the way we talked about it, and that's the problem, too. We don't view this as the standard, if you other things as a standard, then I'm trying to root these weeds out of us so that we have more of a desire and a godly ambition to press in this direction. But as long as we have voices that we entertain or ways of lives that kind of buttress the, the, the wrong sense of what it means to be an individual, that hamstrings us and it prevents us from moving forward. Because then we doubt things that we shouldn't even have to doubt. Mm -hmm. then, we're, then we lose our confidence. And then we can't speak prophetically to others. And so that, I'm trying to deal, I'm trying to help us see the word and hear the word of God so it roots in us so that uh, we can be of one mind and that we can speak the truth to one another toward love when we know what love is. Now, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, because you don't hear this frequently, hardly at all, it's, it's a part of us would say, see, but then, then can it be real? Because <laughs> hardly anyone says these things. Now, I, I'm talking on the level of feeling and intuition that isn't formed by the Spirit. You just have this, you know, you have 5,000 million people or something. That's not a figure, I don't think. But you have, you have you know, all this huge people, and they say, yes, yes. And then there's this other group of people saying, well, that's not quite the way I see it. You're thinking, wow, look at, let's put it on the scales, can we? Let's see. Here's all those people. Here you are. 
Well, you know, what tips the scales here? It's pretty clear. Are these people not godly? Aren't they sincere? Don't they really believe what they believe? Aren't they sacrificial? Aren't they praying? Don't they believe in the Bible? All the answers, yes, 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 yes. So, what's wrong with you? Again, one of the reasons is, brothers and sisters, the standard is not love. Now, once we understand even these people, and they say, oh my goodness, you're right. I believe some of these people would move over here because it's the greatest command. Because God is love. Because covenant is all about living in love. And we just don't even hardly hear it. And if we hear it, it's just only sentimental. It's not a way of life. So, I'm saying, uh, own up to the unfamiliarity of it and be bold in the Word of God. You're going to have to build that up in your own soul. I can't do that for you, and I'm not expecting to do that. But I just want to make it clear that you understand. That anything doesn't make sense if you don't understand some of these things, so the significance of it all. And... Um, so there's a gravity here. I mean, I find it exciting and challenging. It leads you to the cross. It leads you to a deep union with God. But you should under, and you should understand that this word is not your word or my word. It's the word of God. And God wants his people to learn to love and live in love, to have fellowship like he has fellowship. It's not an option for him. That's just his heart. And no matter how strange it might look to others, and if they don't understand this in a paragraph, and we have to use numbers of paragraphs to explain ourselves. Um, it is analogous. I think the most powerful thing, and this is what I'm going to end with, is when uh, King Josiah, King Josiah commissioned the high priest um, Hilkiah to, uh, with some others, to go and uh, check out the money box because the um, it was basically people weren't giving money to the temple anymore and it needed to be rebuilt. So in the process, they went in and in the process of kind of finding that money box, they found the law. And they, they were kind of like, what is this document? <laughs> so they read it to King Josiah. He rents his robes. And then he begins what's called his, um, his whole um, ministry of revival. Then the images fall down. I mean, he, but the thing is, brothers and sisters, the temple was still going on, and they forgot the law. He said, like, what is this book? From generations, the, the word of God had been lost, even though everything looked okay. And, of course, they had confidence well, we've got the temple here. So this is the time of Jeremiah. We've got the temple here. Certainly God wouldn't let anything bad happen to us because he lives in the temple. But they're, they're involved in all kinds of occult mixtures of, of syncretism and, and uh, they're, they're dishonest and they're treating the poor badly and it's just, it's just terrible. And Josiah is uh, commissioning revival. And, but he's so shocked by what he reads when he hears about from the law that he, they try to find a prophet, and they find a prophet, and the prophet tells them, this is a wicked people, but because you've cared, and you have, uh, this has deeply affected you, and you wanted revival, I will gift you with this. You will die before I judge them. Wow. <laughs> My point here, brothers and sisters, is generations of sincere people can really forget important things because, they're, because it suits their flesh. Someone obviously, or groups of people, began to say, I don't think we really need to consult these scrolls. And it gets lost. And I do believe that there's an analogy between that and what we're talking about in reference to fellowship, covenant, love, and Eucharist.